okay the recording has started and uh, so what i planned to discuss today was a bit of isogenies just to give a quick introduction of what they are discuss some examples maybe discuss uh, what are some uh, not like cryptography wise but like just in general mathematically what are some open problems in there and kind of thing so and also i think bambode told me that he's planning a course on isogeny based cryptography so this can be like a quick introduction to yeah, isogeny is it might be helpful later on um yeah before i proceed any questions about uh previous lecture or anything that we have done so far there was a question before uh, the meeting started uh, that uh, there was a question about project so bambode can answer this in more detail but he's planning like a weekly webinar after this class so this is the last class of mine but he's planning a weekly webinar after that to discuss projects and stuff and open problems so that would be good oh so yeah so if you notice in the syllabus that i said earlier uh, everything went according to plan except the last couple of lectures i planned it to be more like implementation specific and stuff like that but like while i was giving the lectures i realized that there is more interest to see maths than like super implementation stuff and like i, I have a feeling you know more than this about me so i thought it would be good to discuss math side of things and the implementation side and everything can be discussed also in project so so that's why i focused on i focused more on while pairings and now isogenies but yeah uh, any questions about anything or previous class or anything we have done so far I mean, it's not possible to cover everything regarding ECC in 10 lectures. There are several resources that you can look for. So one is the textbook. The other is this great book. Uh, one second, let me find. It's... Yeah, the book is called Elliptic Curves, Number Theory and Cryptography. Let me have uh, the title. So I've pinned this message. It's called Elliptic Curves, Number Theory and Cryptography. It's by, so the author of this book is Lawrence Washington. You can find this. It's easily available online. It, uh, you can find the PDF. So. This is, for example, a nice book. If you want to learn more about elliptic curves from mathematical side, a great book is uh, Silverman to start with. The first two chapters of Silverman are quite technical in the sense they use some uh, knowledge of algebraic geometry. But if you skip past that, or you can, if you want to visit that later, once you have learned more algebraic geometry, that is also fine. You can start from chapter three. It starts with like very explicit elliptic curves, their equations, what we discussed, and it goes on from there and later chapters are they discuss some algorithms also like elliptic curves on finite fields for example computing their points and stuff like that so and silverman has a uh, yeah, yeah 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 joe silverman yeah joe silverman arithmetic of elliptic curves and one good thing about that book is after every chapter there are a lot of exercises so if you finish those exercises that 
would be really really awesome uh, you can discuss them in the in your study groups and everything so that's a really good book to learn about elliptic curves <laughs> It's for beginner algebraic geometry, as far as elliptic curves are concerned, uh, I think one great, I already recommended this. I think a great book to start with would be Fulton. Um, it starts, it basically ends on Riemann rock and it takes on from there. Otherwise, it's. Uh, Algebraic geometry is quite vast in its nature. So if you just read algebraic geometry independently, it wouldn't be of much help. So I would really recommend like read a book on elliptic curves and then whatever algebraic geometry or background you need, you can fill in the details. So that's why I think uh, Silverman is a good book. Yeah. 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 Fulton is freely available. I've got to say, the given text, it wasn't clear to me how much of the details about binary coding and so forth were elliptic curves specific or not. By binary coding, do you mean like in the sense of adding point on elliptic curves or something else? In, in a sense of implementing the arithmetic in binary on a computer. Yeah. It's uh, uh, that's discussed in uh, in the reference that I originally mentioned, right? I think. Yeah, yeah I, I I had looked at that, and it seemed again to dive right in, and maybe for people without a background in computer science, it might be a little dense. But that that's maybe something we can discuss in the project. I guess, yeah. I'm not uh, super familiar with, yeah, computer science side of books that are good, so. So this book that I mentioned, uh, Number Theory and Cryptography by Lawrence Washington, it discusses some algorithms. So this, I think this is slightly better book than what I originally mentioned in the sense that it's, it's more mathematical and less computationally dense. It discusses algorithms and everything in detail, but more from a mathematical side of things. So if you want to approach it from that, it, it's, a, it's a good read. And not as, uh, yeah, it, its exposition is easier to read than that of Silverman. Thank you. Yep. OK, so let's. Let's start with that. Those are all the questions. So isogenies. So yeah, so first what is, so suppose we have elliptic curves. Let's say we have two elliptic curves, E1 and E2, both over field K. Then an isogeny between them, let's say it's phi. It's a map on points so it's a curve defined so even an e2 they are curves defined over k but when we think of points you can think of the points in as generality as possible so when you think of points you should really be thinking the points in algebraic closure the largest extension so it's a map from e1 of k bar to e2 of k bar the set of k bar points says that phi is a group homomorphism mm -hmm. okay so that means that if you take two points it must be equal to phi of p plus phi of q 
and just a bit of pedantic detail so this addition on the left hand side is taking place in e1 and the second addition is taking place in e2 right and by group homomorphism the one property that so it follows so whenever you have a group homomorphism because of the fact that it preserves group operations we know the identity has to go to identity so if you take the point at infinity which is the identity point so identity of e1 has to go to identity of e2 so this is uh, an isogeny some uh, another definition or another way to define this would be to say that it's actually a morphism of curves and that would and then you can deduce from that that if you take the set of k points or any field extension in between uh, k points anything in between k bar uh, when you look at uh, when you think of it as a map from k points to it k points or rather l points to l points where l is a general field in between k and k bar then it's a group homomorphism so these properties follow but it's yeah you can also take this as a definition so let's see some examples of isogenies there is always a trivial example that you just send everything to identity but that's not super interesting one example and we have already seen this map we just didn't know that it's called an isogeny so one example is multiplication by m by m map and what is this so m is a natural number and e is an elliptic curve over k so this map it's also denoted as square brackets m it's a map from e to e it takes a point and it sends it to p plus p m times which you can also write as m times p so this is the map and uh, why is this an isogeny this is quite straightforward to see because if we take two points p plus q we send it to m times p plus q but we know our group is abelian right it's the addition is really commutative so this is same as doing m times p plus m times q which is phi of p plus phi of by phi i mean this multiplication by m map so let's also yeah. so whenever we have a group homomorphism there are two natural subgroups associated to it one is kernel and the other is image so this is a bit of recall here so in general if we have a group homomorphism then there are two sort of important subgroups that we get associated to this group homomorphism that tells us a lot about our map and also our domain and our codomain first is kernel is basically all those elements in the domain that map to identity so we collect all the g's in g1 says so that phi of g is identity let me say e or you can also think of it like inverse image of identity that point right and this is a subgroup of g1 and the other important group that we get is image which is as the name suggests we keep on collecting the image so we take phi of g as g varies in g1 right so these are the two important subgroups so we can also ask the same question what is the what what are kernel and images of isogeny so 
one way to think of isogenies is you can think of them as morphism between curves. And it's a theorem that a morphism is either constant or it's surjective. So if your morphism is constant, that means, and we know that identity always maps to identity. So if your morphism or map is constant overall, then everything just maps to identity. In that case, so I'll, I'll just write it down. So if we have isogeny, then there are only two possibilities. Either it is constant or it's non-constant. If it is constant, then since we know that identity maps to identity, so this will tell us that everything goes to identity. So phi of p is just identity, right? That's sort of like a trivial or not very interesting situation. If our map is non-constant, however, in that case, phi is surjective. Okay, so that settles the image. And now the question is, what is kernel? Well, obviously, it depends. It will depend on what our map is and everything. So for example, for this multiplication by m, let's see what the kernel is. So we have this multiplication. <clears throat> P goes to MP. So the kernel is all those points in E of K bar such that when you add P to itself M number of times, you get back the identity. And these are precisely what we call M torsion points. Right? So this is I've used this notation before, but this is, you can also think of it as now kernel of this map. So these are precisely M torsion points of A. Now again, this, just a bit of reminder, like it, there is no reason for this M torsion point to be defined on K itself. My curve is defined over K. So when you think of E as an equation, the coefficients come from K. But when we think of points, the points can lie in higher extension. So all these M torsion points, they need not lie in K, but they, they lie in something in between. And we can think of them, all of them inside K bar. Okay. So just a couple of more observations here. So this. So if you remember how we defined addition on elliptic curves when we take two points and add them, we got an equation that was defined over our field over which our curve is defined to begin with, so our base field. So we can repeat that process inductively, right? And that thing would still be true. So this map M is also defined over k, where k is the field over which my elliptic curve is defined, let's say. And what do I mean by this statement is, like, if you think of writing down this map algebraically or in terms of specific polynomials, the coefficients of those polynomials will be in k. So this is defined over k. So just a bit of terminology here. if phi is an isogeny, and it is, let's say these are curves over k, and it is defined over k, some people use this word that it's k rational, something, phi is k rational. But this is just like more like a convention of different books. So in case you're reading, you, you notice this word somewhere, all this means is that phi is defined over k. And in general, it, there is no reason uh, for an isogeny to be defined over the base field. It can be defined over a higher extension. So 
So let's see another example. And this one is important when we think of elliptic curves over finite fields. So this is Frobenius map. And it's also very helpful in cryptography. It's used in attacking some uh, crypto systems. So Frobenius map. So before discussing this on elliptic curves, let's discuss them over finite fields. So this will also serve as a bit of refresher on finite fields. So suppose P is a prime. And let's say we take a finite field over FP. So FQ is a finite field where Q is a power of P. Right? So remember that whenever we talk of finite fields, they are so if your field is finite when you look at its characteristic it must be prime right so every finite field is basically field extension of fp and what is fp it's uh, basically our equivalence classes or z mod pz right so in general if we talk about a, a finite field its cardinality is power of a prime where P is basically characteristic of my field, right? So suppose, let's say I have that. Then Frobenius map on FQ is this map phi, or let me use different name, let me say pi, from FQ bar to FQ bar. It takes x and it sends it to x to the power q. And by fq bar, I mean the you take the algebraic closure of it. So this map, when we look at it over fields, this is a field homomorphism. Why is this a field homomorphism? Again, when we so whenever we talk about homomorphisms between two objects, all we mean is that it's a map that preserves the structure. So when we talk about group homomorphism, we say that it's a map that preserves the group structure. When we say something is a field homomorphism, field has two operations going on in it. One is addition and other is multiplication. So it preserves both addition and multiplication. So Seeing why it preserves multiplication is easy because if we have x times y, pi will send it to the power. But again, in field, everything is commutative. So this is just x to the power q, y to the power q, which is <laughs> pi of x times pi of y. So multiplication is preserved. Addition is slightly trickier to see but it works. If we have x plus y, we'll send it to x plus y to the power q. And this is x to the power q plus a binomial theorem, y to the power q. And then we have a bunch of terms. So we'll have summation x to the power r, y to the power q minus r and it's q choose r, where r goes from 1 to q minus 1. We can also like combine everything into single sum and let r go from 0 to q, which is what the first two terms are. But I wanted to write this separately for one reason. Um, so if you look at this sum, and remember, we are in FQ, right? We are in a finite field, which has characteristic P. So anything that is a multiple of P will be 0. So when we look at Q choose R, this is essentially Q factorial, R factorial, Q minus R factorial. And you can show that actually P will divide this. All of these binomial coefficients will be divisible by P. 
so except the first two terms everything else vanishes in my field so this will simply reduce to x to the power q plus y to the power q which is pi x plus pi y Obviously, this sort of thing doesn't work in characteristic zero because we have to take care of all these mixed and extra terms. But over finite fields, are we have like binomial theorem is really simple. It's what yeah, it's what one wishes for, but one never gets. So it's it's very simple. So like for example, x square plus y uh, sorry x plus y whole square is simply x square plus y square in F two. So yeah, so this is a field homomorphism on, on field level. So now on elliptic curves, so this is, if we talk about elliptic curves, taking motivation from that. So Frobenius is what one would expect. So my elliptic curve is defined over a finite field now. And this is the map. Let me use the same notation pi. So I take a point. Let's say its coordinates in projective plane are x, y, z. And I send it to x to the power q, y to the power q, and z to the power q. And we have already we have already shown that it's uh, it when you look at points, it it's a it's a homomorphism, it respects these things. So just a couple of observations here. So if we go to field side of things, I'm sending x to x to the power of q, right? And when I restrict it to, let's say, so pi, I defined it on algebraic closure. like this, x goes to x to the power q. So when I restrict it to my base field, when I only want to look at fq, x will be going to xq. But this, on when we look at it over base field, this simply reduces to identity. So this is just x. This is because one way to say this is if you so it can uh, it can depend on your definition of finite field how you construct them but if I remember when I discussed finite fields I defined them like this so we have <coughs> excuse me so we have our base field to start with and if we want to define finite fields let's say we are taking a degree r extension. So we want to find a finite field with p to the power r elements, which is, let's say, our q in this case. One way to do this is to construct them via polynomials. So I take this polynomial, x to the power q minus x, look at all its roots, and basically attach those roots to fp. And that's the degree r extension, really, because it will have q elements and everything. So FPR, one way to think of this is basically it, it contains roots of all, uh, it contains all the roots of this polynomial, xq minus x. So any number in fq satisfies this equation, xqx. So, let me see. So attach roots of this to fp. So restricted to our base field, this is simply identity. But obviously, when we go higher than that, we are looking at fq bar. So in everything in between, this won't be identity. But restricted to base field, this is. So in other words, pi is also a member of my Galois group, fq bar over fq. Galba group is nothing, but it's basically a group of all those. So I collect all the maps from FQ bar to FQ bar that are automorphisms. So it, one can also show that this is also an automorphism that fix FQ. So pi, pi lies in this group. 
And similarly, we can see this. So elliptic curve, when we look at its FQ points, on that, it will be identity. But of course, we are looking in general over FQ bar, so that it fails to be identity there. But over, yeah, over the base field, this is just uh, identity. Yeah. So some, uh, maybe I think it's a good time to discuss some problems or uh, not really problems, but like some sort of things that one can do with it. It's so there's this question of uh, counting points on elliptic curves over finite fields. So if we have an elliptic curve, let's say it's defined over FQ, this is a very natural question. Or let me say FP, rather. Just keep it on FP. So, it, so obviously, there are, so it's an equation with only finitely many possible solutions, right? So this cardinality, how many points are there? It's really a, a finite set, right? And it would be interesting to count this. So this is, one would expect its number to be P plus one, one, the extra being the point at infinity, which is always there. But this is not really the case. It's not p plus 1. It's off by p plus 1. And this number is what is also called the correction factor in this. And this is quite amazing. It turns out that this number is actually related to our uh, Frobenius. And how it's related, let me just uh, give a brief overview of this. So we define Frobenius on uh, points of elliptic curves, right? In general, if I take, so suppose L is another prime, but it's not equal to P. So instead of looking at all the points of my E over FP bar, that's a huge set, I will restrict it, okay? Instead of looking at all the points, I will only look at L torsion points. And remember, these points are, again, they are not necessarily defined over base field, but obviously they will all be defined over K bar, uh, sorry, FP bar. But I'm only looking at L points. So when we restrict our Frobenius to any L torsion point, it will take L torsion point to L torsion point. It, uh, it it preserves the torsion property. So the map that we originally defined, x raising coordinates to qth power. So if you start with a point that is L torsion, you raise the coordinates to qth power, again, it will be L torsion. That property is not affected. So this tells me something already. So I can do the following. So any M torsion, right? If we talk of any torsion, uh, it's if you think of elliptic curves over complex numbers as given by lattices, one can think of EL or for that matter any EM as is isomorphic to Z mod L direct product with z mod l <coughs> this set z mod l cross z mod l is the usual cartesian product that one would expect and we can now we can turn this cartesian product into group structure by just taking so you take two tuples and you just add and multiply them component wise so this will turn it into a group and it one can show that this the set of L torsion points is basically just a product of Z model twice, right? So one can take, uh, so if you think of this group, all you need to, so basically everything here is basically multiples of one zero and zero one, right? 
you keep adding one zero to itself, you will get all the points in Z model, one copy. And then if you keep adding zero comma one to itself, we'll get the other copy. And then you can add them. So basically everything is linear combination of these two things, right? So if you think of this as a vector space, so another way to think of this would be to think of EL as a vector space over Z mod L, which turns out to be a field. So it, there are two copies, right? So it's a dimension two thing. So it has, so one can think of, so it's dimension two, there are two copies, right? So, so that tells me that EL has a basis of two torsion points, let's say P and Q. Okay, these are these two are L torsion points, and basically every other torsion point is basically some linear combination of this. So now what this tells me is that since my Frobenius maps L torsion to L torsion, what can I say about all I need to know is where P and Q are getting mapped. Once I know what is the image of P and Q, I can deduce image of every other point, right? This is simply because so if we know pi of p and pi of q, then I know pi of, let's say, a p plus b q, which is every other torsion point, right? Since p and q are bases, any torsion point is a linear combination. Then I know pi of a p plus b q. And how do I know this? I know this simply because I know that uh, pi is a group homomorphism, right? So it preserves addition. So pi of AP plus BQ is first of all, it's pi of AP plus pi of BQ. And remember A and B are again, they are not some random numbers, they are integers. We are talking about, so my scalars are coming from this field, right? So A and B are simply numbers or natural numbers. So pi of AP, AP is just like adding P to itself a number of times. So pi of AP, again, because it preserves addition, it's A of pi P plus B of pi Q, right? So if I know pi P and pi Q, I know what is pi of AP plus BQ. I simply have to take this combination and I'm done, right? So yeah, to... To completely determine P, all I have to do is I have to determine what is the image of P and image of Q, right? So let me write this map again. So pi is from EL to EL. And I don't know how it acts, obviously. It would depend on elliptic curves and also on L. But what I do know from this information is that P will go to some torsion point right p has to go to some torsion point and every torsion point in el is a combination of p and q so let's say p goes to ap plus bq this is like if you're familiar with linear maps and how we do things this is a very specific application of that and also i know that q has to go to let's say cp plus dq And once I know this information, basically once I know A, B, C, D, I know pi because I know how P and Q are going. So basically pi is determined by this matrix. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm writing it correctly. It's A, B, C, D, if I'm correct. Yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, one can also take transpose, it doesn't change much, but it's, yeah, R writing this in column format, A, B, C, D, right? So this matrix is there. Anyway, whatever the choice, it's either this or some people also like to use this transpose. It's really just a matter of how you think of your torsion points as row or column. 
anyway taking transpose or not it won't affect my uh, trace or determinant and i'm going to talk about that later talk about that now so so okay so we started with so our Basically, what I was discussing is if we want to count these points, this A is really the important thing. This is the correction factor that tells me the number of points. And this correction factor is related to my Frobenius. And how is this related? So I take a Frobenius. I have an associated matrix to this. So it turns out that this A is nothing but trace of this matrix A, C, B, T. Obviously, everything is modulo L now. So this is, so A is equal to this, modulo L. And it turns out that P, remember FP is the original base field over my elliptic curve is defined. This P is nothing but determinant of this matrix, modulo L. Right? So this is already something very concrete. So if I want to know A, and remember A is, I'm not happy to know A modulo L, I want to know it as an integer. So what I can do is, and this basically works for any L not equal to P. So all I have to do this, do it uh, now, is to determine A. What we can do is take different L's, take different L's, or basically different primes, or, you just have to make sure that L is not equal to P and determine by taking this Frobenius, take the trace and determine A mod L. And once you have done this for a bunch of L's, uh, you can use Chinese remainder theorem. To get the possibilities and obviously, and also, you can use uh, some bounds on A, right? So there are some known bounds on A, they're called Hasse bounds or while bounds, that it has to be less than or equal to two times square root of P or so. Yeah, it's absolute value has to be in there. So using all that information, combining that, you can completely determine uh, A. And you can find out your number of points on elliptic curves. So this is... Uh, one implement implementation of this is a Skoos algorithm. Which is a good, uh, maybe it's a good idea as an exercise to, so probably as an exercise to probably explore this further. As in, what is the Skoos algorithm? How, just try some baby examples and maybe try it on general elliptic curves to see how well this functions and everything. So, Skoos algorithm is basically implementation of this. So, uh, algorithm to find a. Let me see this. <clears throat> So this is one possible uh, thing, interesting thing about Frobenius. Why do we care and everything? Because it helps us to count number of points in elliptic curves. And obviously, these point counting is very, very important when it comes to cryptography. Because if you want to think of solving problems like DLP and everything, this can be really helpful. The other possible uh, sort of thing or sort of questions that once, and this is more mathematical. So if if somebody is interested, we can chat on this because some of my research is on this. But just to sort of say it's so when we think of isogenies, isogeny is really an uh, so okay. Let me define what do I mean by this. So so I'll take a set and I'll define a relation on it. So this is my set. So let's say S is the set of, I don't need this, it's a set of all elliptic curves defined over K. K is any field of your choice, so fix a field. And on this set, I'll define a relation 
So I'll say that two curves E1 and E2 are related to each other if and only if there is an isogeny between them. Okay, this is a relation uh, and it turns out that this is actually an equivalence relation. So if uh, you're not familiar, to check that some relation is an equivalence relation, we have to check three properties. So first is first is a reflexive property. This means that every curve must be related to itself, right? But this is obviously true. So if we take E and E, there is a, there are lots of isogenies from E to E. Like we already saw it, multiplication by M and everything. But we can always take identity. That's the obvious one. So E is uh, obviously an isogeny. Uh, sorry, E is isogenous to itself. So lots of isogenies from E to E. So that tells me that E is related to itself. So it is reflexive for any elliptic curve. The third property is easier to check here, and I'll do that first. Third property is what we call transitive nature or transitive property. What it means is, suppose we have three elliptic curves, E1, E2, and E3. And suppose I know that E1 is related to E2. So in that case, it would mean that there is an isogeny from E1 to E2. Let's say phi one And I also know that there is an isogeny from E2 to E3. Let's say phi 2 then the question is whether E1 is related to E3 or not, or can I find an isogeny from E1 to E3? But again, in this case, it's quite clear what one can do. There is, there is one natural choice and that works. So I have a map from E1 to E2, I have a map from E2 to E3, I can compose them to get the map from E1 to E3 and I do that. So I take phi2 of phi1, and composition of uh, isogenies is isogeny. Because remember, isogeny is nothing but when you look at k bar points, it's a group homomorphism. So when you compose two group homomorphisms, you will again get a group homomorphism. So transitive also works. The second property is uh, slightly tricky, but it works nonetheless. It's a symmetric, symmetry, symmetric property. So in this case, the question is, suppose I know that E1 is related to E2, so there is an isogeny between them. Can I say whether E2 is related to E1 or not? Or can I find an isogeny from E2 to E1? Obviously, if E1 is equal to E2, this question is rather, it's, it's obvious. But if E1 and E2 are different, it's not immediately clear how we can go back, right? Like on, on, if we simply think of on sets without any structure, then we can always take the inverse map, right? If it exists, if it makes sense. But this has a lot of structure, so it's not immediately obvious if we can pull all that baggage. But it turns out we can do this, in fact. So the question is yes. Uh, sorry, the answer is yes. We can find a map from E2 to E1. And this is called dual isogeny so it exists okay dual isogeny is unique in fact so given so in what sense it's unique i'll just explain so if we start with an isogeny from e1 to e2 then we can find so there exists a unique isogeny phi hat from e2 to e1 and unique in the sense that it satisfies the following so if we compose them so if i take the composition of phi bar with phi so phi is from e1 to e2 
and phi tilde is from e2 to e1 so this is a map from e1 to e1 this turns out to be equal to so this is same as multiplication by m and what is m here m is just the so m is basically just the size of kernel of phi and how do we explicitly find this so there is a very neat way to find this so i want a map from e2 to e1 so i do this i first of all i go from e2 to the picard group or really the divisor group of e2 and remember what this was so this divisor zero of e2 what we do is we take all degree zero divisors and we quotient it out by all the principal divisors on e2 and for elliptic curves it is also true that these uh, these two things are really isomorphic if we go to higher genus then they are really different it's not true that your curve is same as your Jacobian. But for elliptic curves, the Jacobian is really the elliptic curve. So it's really nice. So anyway, so this map is basically we take a point and we send it to this divisor, Q minus the identity. And, uh, and again, just a reminder, it's a, these are divisors, right? It's a formal sum. So it's not like I'm literally adding Q minus 0. It's a formal sum. Okay, so this is my divisor. From here, I go to Picard group or divisor group of E1. And how do I do that? So this is my map phi star or really the pullback. What it does is, so how do I go from here? So if I have a, let's say, I'll explain this map on individual points. And for divisors, we can literally add the corresponding things for each point, right? And that will be my divisor. So if I have, let's say, a point here, Q, let's say a divisor that is just a point with coefficient 1. So where do I send it to? I send it to this divisor. So I take summation P with coefficient 1. And where is P varying? P is basically all the inverse image of Q. So remember, I start with a map phi from E1 to E2. Okay. So Q is a point here. Q is now a point in E2. I basically collect all the points in E1 that map to Q. So those are all the points. And I take this formal sum, all the points are not. And now if I have a general divisor, what do I do? Well, I take, uh, I look at each point. It, it maps like this, and I basically attach the coefficients uh, similarly. So, like for example, if I had 2q, it will go to twice of this. So, I do it like this point by point and coefficient by coefficient. Okay, this is my pullback map. And now we are almost done. So, from here, we have to go to e1, and this is what I do. So, Let's say I start with a divisor here. So let's say my divisor looks something like uh, summation NPP. So this is a divisor. So let me highlight that this is a formal sum. Right? When I think of divisors, I really think of formal sums. I really think of polynomials, where your P and whatever the points are, those are the variables, and NPs are the coefficients. And where do I send this to? Well, I send it to the exact same thing, summation NPP, except now it's not a formal sum. It's an actual sum. I actually add the points. So just to give an example, if my divisor, let's say, if I start with divisor something like uh, P plus Q, right, where P and Q are points with one one coefficient each, and I want to send it to E1. So what I do is I literally send it to P plus Q, like how I would add in elliptic curves, and I send it to that point. So, so when you compose all these things, 
we get an isogeny from A to do E1, and that is the dual isogeny. Okay, so sum is, so like just to conclude, what I was trying to say is that if we take the set of all elliptic curves defined over K, then I can define a relation between them. I'll say that two curves are related if and only if they are isogenous. And it turns out that this is really an equivalence relation. right? And there are a lot of interesting questions right? that start at this point. So suppose my K is Q. So these are some open slash interesting questions. So first is, uh, suppose K is Q. So if I look at all the elliptic curves defined over rational numbers, then a very natural question is, how many elliptic curves are there in an isogeny class? And this, like, uh, so basically this, so if you take an elliptic curve, so isogeny class of E is basically the equivalence class or just the set of all e over q or e prime over q says that e is related to e prime or e is isogenous to e prime okay so this is isogeny class or just the equivalence class of that relation that we just discussed so it's a very natural question to ask look okay so if i take an elliptic curve so is there a maximum number that I can find uh, such that my isogeny class doesn't exceed that size. And it turns out for k equal to q, the answer is yes, you can find that number. And that number is in fact 8. So you take any uh, elliptic curve. So size of its isogeny class is really uh, not more than it. And it doesn't take every number from 1 to 8. In fact, it's uh, the possible numbers are, if I, if I remember correctly, it's 1, 2, 3, 4. I don't think there is something called 5. And then 6 and 8. So it misses 5 and 7. So it takes these possible numbers. And there is a very neat, uh, there is a very neat uh, algorithm actually, or not even algorithm, like a very neat description of what do these things look like. So from here, you can ask all sorts of questions. So, okay, so you take an elliptic curve, right? We have this isogeny class. So you have collected all the elliptic curves that are isogenous to it. And it's, uh, you have a nice concrete number, you have no more than eight. So you can think of arranging them in some sort of graph, right? So, for example, like this is one possible situation. Suppose there are only two curves in its isogeny class. So E1 and E2. And we, so there is an isogeny between them. And whatever is the kernel of phi, we label the edge by size of that kernel, so 2. So in that case, kernel of phi is 2. So you can think of these things as uh, graphs, and then you can ask what are all the possible types. And it turns out there are not that many. So like, for example, when you have a singleton, you cannot do much with it. When you have two, you can arrange them like this. When you have three, again, it's like a tree sort of a situation. For four and six and eight, we get different possible things. So let me see if I can. Uh, So like, so for example, uh, for four, if you want to arrange them, you can sort of do it in two ways. It's, you can arrange them in rectangle like this, or you can arrange them in a sort of tree sort of a situation. So these are all like various type of graphs and six and eight have more combinations, right? So this is this is over Q. This is studied and well known and everything. But what is interesting, or this is the open part, this is not known. 
for higher number fields. Like even for quadratic fields, we really don't know is there is there like is there like a maximum bound like this eight or something? What is that bound? And if yes, what do these graphs look like and everything? So this is really this is really a wide open thing. And even for finite fields, one can ask the same question: What is the maximum number of isogeny class? How do we arrange the graphs and everything? So. So over higher number fields, and also this might be interesting to consider it over finite fields. And this sort of thinking of uh, these elliptic curves in terms of why are they isogeny. So you take an elliptic curve, you take its isogeny class, and you're going from one to the other. It's kind of very useful for cryptographic applications because you can, let's say, one, it might be easier to solve DLP or something in one elliptic curve. So if you have a tough elliptic curve, probably you can connect it to a weak elliptic curve by isogeny. And I think there are. Uh, I think there are a lot of resources that you can find, uh, talks and papers and everything. Let me know. I can find some and share on Zulip. I think they're called isogeny volcanoes or something. So people do all these kind of things, like going from one to the other by, the, by these paths and sort of thinking of which is the best uh, point to attack. So yeah, so I think I've almost passed my time. So I'll I'll stop here. So. The idea was to just uh, get a quick introduction of isogenies and to sort of discuss what are some interesting things and problems over this that, or directions that one can explore. So, yeah, okay. Thank you. I'll uh, close recording, and if we have any questions, we can discuss them. <laughs>